Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's lovely to be here uh, virtually. Um, I thought I would talk today about some work we've been doing in my research group over the past a uh, couple of years um, and, and also that we will be doing into the future for the next couple of years. Um, this is to do with how the brain combines light signals across the eyes, so how we make binocular combinations of um, our, our eyes inputs. Um, so what I'll do is uh, I'll start off by I guess giving you a sort of almost like a maths lesson about how in principle the brain might combine information. And then I'll show you some data about how the brain actually appears to do this job of combining signals across the eyes. Uh, I'll first show you some data from uh, the literature um, on binocular combination of contrast. Then I'll uh, talk about some work that we've been doing in the lab over the past year or two about binocular combination of luminance flicker. Um, and that will include a combined pupillometry and EEG experiment, and also a psychophysical matching task. And then at the end, I'll just talk briefly about where we're going with this work um, and the sort of experiments that we have planned over the next few years. Okay, so uh, hopefully you'll indulge my, uh, my maths lesson now. So how in principle might the brain combine information? Imagine that we have two separate channels which we're going to somehow combine together. Now, in all of the examples today, those two channels are going to be the left and right eyes. But in principle, they could be other sorts of channels as well. They could be different locations in space, perhaps adjacent locations on the retina, or they could be different feature channels, for example, different color channels or different um, orientations or spatial frequencies or something like that. But for today, we're just thinking about binocular combination. And the very simplest thing that we could do is just add those two signals together. We could linearly combine the inputs in the left and right eyes to give us a binocular response. So our binocular response then, which is shown in the graph in blue, is the sum of two monocular responses in the left and right eyes. And that means that always the binocular response will be double the response to a single eye's um, response on its own. So the monocular response in that graph is shown in gray and the binocular response is shown in blue. And at all points on the curve, the blue line is double the gray line. You might be thinking, um, well, why, if this is linear combination, if this is a linear system, why do these two lines look curvy? And that's just a consequence of the fact that I've plotted them on a graph which has a logarithmic x-axis and a linear y-axis. So we don't need to worry too much about that. That just makes them look curvy. But really, those are straight lines. OK, so that's linear combination. And that's the, the very most sort of basic thing we might think about uh, for signal combination. At the opposite extreme, we could choose the channel which has the biggest response. We can, might, might call that a winner-takes-all type approach. And we can implement that with a max operator. So if we have our two monocular inputs, L and R, left and right, we can take the maximum response. And that will have uh, the effect that the binocular response, when we stimulate both eyes at the same time, will always be the same as the monocular response to a single stimulus. You can see in the graph there that the blue and gray curves sit right on top of each other. These are two very extreme positions. And actually, what might be more useful is to be able to transition smoothly between these extremes. And we can do this by using an exponent on the two inputs, which we can call Q. If we raise each of those inputs to that exponent before summation, we add them together, and then we raise them just for a sort of tidiness to the inverse of that exponent, uh, just to kind of undo the exponentiation. Well, then we can have both of those behaviors depending on the value of the exponent. If it's one, then combination is linear, as I showed you in the first graph. If the exponent is infinite, or in fact, in practice, just quite large, like around about 20, then that's equivalent to a max operation. But we can also have intermediate versions, intermediate values, rather, of that exponent. So for example, a value of two for the exponent gives us the quadratic summation, um, where the binocular response is root two times the monocular response, which is what's shown in that panel on the right. One more slide about this kind of thing. 
there's an alternative way of getting this wide range of behaviors other than just changing that early exponent. If we have a gain control circuit, then we can get this whole variety of different model behaviors that I've just shown you by varying the amount of suppression between the left and right eyes. And the equation here, um, the numerator is exactly what we had before. We have our two inputs, left and right raised to an exponent, but each of these values is scaled by a denominator term, which includes a constant S, that same eyes input, uh, and then the opposite eyes input multiplied by a weight. And that model arrangement comes from a, a paper from 2006 by Tim Mies um, et al. Um, and it can give a very wide range of model behaviors. Um, and this was really something that Fred Kingdom demonstrated in a 2015 paper. If you change the weight of suppression there, keeping the exponent constant, keeping everything else the same, then you can again get this same family of curves out uh, going from a linear type summation where the uh, weight is zero down to an almost max type behavior when the weight is uh, large, when the weight is one or higher. So that's the sort of thing that we might expect the visual system to be able to do when it's combining two inputs. That's a sort of hypothetical set of possible behaviors. And so it's reasonable for us to ask then what actually happens, what happens in the brain when we present either a monoc or a binocular stimulus in varying contrasts. Well, as I'm sure most of you are aware, vision scientists really like sine wave gratings, and so most of the literature on binocular combination uses sine wave gratings as stimuli. The signal is the spatial contrast in the left and the right eyes, so that tends to be the uh, difference between the brightest and the darkest parts of the sine wave of the grating. Um, and across a, a surprisingly wide range of studies, we tend to find that binocular responses are about equal to monocular responses at high contrasts. And that's consistent across many different methods. So here are some data from a study of mine from five years ago. Here we used steady state EEG, and we measured the brain's response to either binocular or monocular uh, grating stimuli, which here were flickering at five hertz. Um, and you can see that there's a slight increase across some of the contrasts in the binocular condition, but overall uh, those squares and circles are very, very close together. So we have approximately equal responses to monocular and binocular stimulation. The same is true when we measure with MRI. Here are some data from a paper by Maradi and Heger from Journal of Vision. And the key conditions here are the MG monocular grating and BG binocular grating conditions. Those are the first two bars in the bottom uh, bar chart and the lower two curves in that time course of the MRI bold signal. And you can see that in both cases, uh, those data look very similar across the monocular and binocular conditions. Here are some more recent data. These are from uh, a macaque neurophysiology study that was published this year in iScience by Mitchell et al. And here they looked at the time course of the response to monocular versus binocular stimuli, um, shown in three different time windows at the bottom there. Um, there seems to be a bit of a binocular advantage very early on in uh, around about the first 100 or so milliseconds. Uh, but by the time you get to 150 or so milliseconds after stimulus presentation, those two curves very much overlap. That's what's shown in the bottom right uh, curve there. So again, bin equals mon at high contrasts um, in V1. So that's uh, single unit data from V1. And then finally, uh, just to show you some classic psychophysical results, uh, these data are from a paper by Gordon Legg from the 1980s. And here he measured um, contrast discrimination thresholds for monocular and binocular presentation. And you can see that across that quite wide range of high contrast pedestal levels, our sensitivity at detecting an increment uh, in the contrast of a grating is about the same for monocular and binocular presentation. So if I'd been giving this talk about five years ago, I would have said, well, I think we've got the hang of this. I think we understand what happens um, in the brain when we combine stimuli across the eyes. Up at high contrasts, 
the brain achieves what we might call ocularity invariance by normalizing the signals across the eyes. So in other words, when we show binocular stimuli, they inhibit each other, they suppress each other to cancel out the additional excitation from having both channels, both eyes activated. And that has a kind of face validity really about our everyday experience that if you open and close one eye, the world doesn't change its appearance very much. It doesn't really change in contrast. Um, and so this ocularity invariance principle might be responsible for giving us binocular single vision. And that seemed like quite a, a satisfying story to me. But unfortunately, sine wave gratings are not the only things that the brain has to deal with. We don't just see stimuli uh, which vary in achromatic contrast. There are all kinds of other signals that the brain has to deal with, things like luminance, colour and motion. And in principle, they might all be treated in different ways. Of course, they might all be treated in very much the same way, but we don't really know that yet. So, so um, this idea of, uh, of ocularity invariance was my kind of default assumption about what should happen for all these other types of signals until I saw this paper published in 2018 by uh, Quire, Optical and Cumming. Uh, and in this study, they used a slightly different paradigm. They used very rapidly moving stimuli. They were actually gratings, uh, but they moved, moved very, very rapidly across the screen. Um, and when that happens, your eyes follow the moving stimulus. Very briefly, for about the first 150 or so milliseconds, we have a rapid involuntary eye movement response that we don't have any control over at all. Um, and that's in response to rapid motion. And what Quire, Optical and Cumming did was they measured this response um, for stimuli presented monocularly versus binocularly. And their data shown as a function of contrast are in the bottom right plot there. In blue, we have the monocular data. So the blue data points are for monocular presentation. And the dashed blue line is what we would expect if the um, binocular response would double the monocular response. What you can see is that across that very wide range of contrasts, all the way up to 40% contrast, the binocular response is more than double the monocular response. So we have a huge summation effect there, a super summation effect, if you like. Um, which is completely different from what has typically been observed in, uh, for example, V1 in response to gratings. And that really got me thinking that, well, perhaps binocular combination works in a different way in different parts of the brain, in response to different stimuli, and maybe in sort of different anatomical pathways. And I thought a, a bit more about that um, and started looking into where else the brain might need to combine information across the eyes in addition to V1. Uh, so if this is a lovely diagram, by the way, by uh, Sam Strong, who's uh, a lecturer at Aston University and also sort of moonlights as a, uh, a scientific illustrator. Um, this is a really nice diagram that shows, first of all, the canonical pathway, which every undergraduate student of perception is aware of. So we have the world, uh, which is passed through the two eyes um, and the signals end up at primary visual cortex at the back of the head. One hemisphere represents one hemifield, the other hemisphere represents the other hemifield. And uh, as most undergraduates learn, V1 is the first place in the brain where signals are combined across the two eyes. So that's primary visual cortex. And I've started referring to that route from the eye through the LGN to primary visual cortex as the canonical visual pathway. That's sort of the, the thing that we think of when we think about binocular vision, we think about that route through the brain and that gives us things like stereopsis and conscious binocular vision. But it turns out there are also other places in the brain where uh, signals are or potentially are combined across the eyes. So there's a whole network of subcortical nuclei that govern things like the pupil response and our circadian rhythms, which also take input from the retina, from the eye, um, and presumably somehow combine that information across the left and right eyes. Given the choir uh, findings, 
there might also be some kind of a distinct cortical pathway responsible for processing those rapid binocular eye movements or for driving those rapid binocular eye movements that they were measuring. And that seems like it might combine information in a very different way from the canonical pathway. And then even within that canonical route through V1, is it the case that all stimuli are treated in the same way? So most of what we know about binocular combination in V1 is really to do with sine wave grating stimuli, but perhaps, uh, and achromatic sine wave grating stimuli at that, but perhaps other types of cues like luminance might be processed rather differently. So to dig into all of this a little bit more, we started doing some pupillometry. And pupillometry seemed like a really good choice because it's very well established that our pupil responses are binocular. I'm going to show you a video, which hopefully will work over Zoom, of my own eyes recorded using a binocular eye tracker. We use the Pupil Lab system. They're really, really, really good eye trackers. Um, and what's happening here uh, is I'm tracking both of my pupils as I, I turn off the lights. And so you can see, first of all, that my pupils are dilating. And then I'm going to shine a bright light just into one eye. Uh, just here it goes. Um, so you can see the, if I just rewind a little bit, you can see the little speck uh, of the torch shining into the eye on the right there. You can see there are, uh, there, so there are two uh, vertically aligned dots. Those are just the infrared light source. I can't see those because they're outside of the visible spectrum. And then that third dot that appears in the right eye's image just inside of my pupil, that's me shining a light just into that eye. But you can see very clearly that both of my pupils constrict by about the same amount. I'm going to do it again. My eyes are dilating and I'm going to shine a light into one eye. Here it comes any second now and you'll see both pupils, there we go, both of them dilate. So that's called the consensual response, and that's telling us that on some level the brain must be combining information across the two eyes in order to know when to constrict the pupils. So that's a demo. In the lab we do this in a slightly different way. We use what's called a steady state approach. So we take a stimulus, a disk of light, and we flicker its brightness um, sinusoidally over time. So we modulate the amplitude of the luminance there that's going into the eye. And we're able to direct light to the left and right eyes independently by using a mirror stereoscope uh, with four mirrors as pictured in the top right. So we just use a, for this study, we just used a standard CRT monitor and we showed the stimuli on the left and right hand sides of the screen and then used the stereoscope to direct those stimuli in to the left and right eyes of the participant. And we record pupil diameter using that eye tracker continuously. And we also record EEG activity simultaneously. So when we produce flickering lights like this, uh, the pupil response is to flicker as well, I guess, to oscillate up and down, uh, to dilate and constrict um, along with the light. Uh, and just in the bottom right trace there, you can see some pilot data for when we were setting all of this up. The sine wave at the top is uh, the, the driving signal from the light. Um, and then the traces at the bottom in blue and in pink are the pupil diameters in the left and the right eyes. And you can see there's a very strong oscillatory component there at the driving frequency at two hertz. What we do with these data is to take the Fourier transform and to pull out the amplitude at the flicker frequency. And because we know precisely what the flicker frequency was, uh, we're able to get a really lovely, well isolated signal in the Fourier domain. Uh, so you can see in the top plot there, we have a really clear spike at two hertz in our pupillometry data. And then in the bottom plot, uh, which is our EEG data, we also see a big spike at two hertz. That's the steady state signal. Um, and also it turns out for the EEG data, we get a second harmonic response as well at four hertz. I'll say a bit more about that um, in a moment. Now the rationale here, the reason for doing simultaneous pupillometry and EEG is that we would expect that the pupil responses are probing binocular combination in that network of subcortical nuclei that I showed you a few slides ago, which govern pupil diameter. On the other hand, the EEG responses we take from right above early visual cortex. We take the uh, response right at the back of the head on top of 
uh, basically V1, V2, those very early visual areas. So what we're hopefully able to do with this paradigm is to dissociate activity in two completely anatomically distinct pathways, both of which are combining the same signals binocularly. And that means we can ask whether they're combining those signals in the same way or in rather different ways. So we collected data. We, we, we've actually run this experiment twice. We ran it as a pilot study, first of all, uh, on about a dozen or so participants. And then we made a few kind of very fairly minor changes to the stimuli. We put in some fusion uh, crosses around the outside just to, to give participants an easier job of uh, fusing the stimulus. And then we ran it for real um, on a group of 30 participants. Um, most of this work was done by my PhD student, Federico Sagala, um, and we included quite a wide range of conditions. I'm going to talk about three of them today, monocular and binocular presentation across a range of contrasts, a range of flicker amplitudes, and then a third condition, uh, which was to show a two hertz signal to one eye monocularly, and then in the other eye to show a dicoptic mask signal at a different temporal frequency, uh, which allows us to look at interocular suppression. So to look at how the monocular response at two hertz is um, affected by flicker in the opposite eye, in the other eye. So here are some results. Pupillometry data, first of all. Uh, and what I've plotted here are contrast response functions for monocular and binocular and dicoptic conditions. The first thing to note is that we do get contrast response functions using this method. And I, I think this is possibly the first time this has actually been done. Um, I, I don't, I'm not aware of other studies uh, where people have measured contrast response functions for pupillometry data in this way and using the Fourier spectrum and so on. So these, we, we get contrast response functions, which is reassuring. Uh, it wasn't a given that we would do so. Um, and what we can see is that there's a, a, a slight increase in the response to binocular stimuli across most of that contrast range there. Uh, on average, it's about 1.6 times the monocular response. So we're getting something of a, a facilitation effect. Uh, it's not the case that bin equals mon across the whole contrast range, so it looks like we might be getting to there by the very, very highest contrast. The other thing that we notice here is in the dicoptic condition. So remember that the target is the same as in the monocular condition, but here we've added an extra mask into the other eye. And what that does is it suppresses the monocular response. So we get a reduction, a rightward shift, actually, if you like, of the contrast response function. Um, so that's evidence of interocular suppression there. So those are our pupillometry data. What happens with EEG? In our EEG data, we get very different results. And these were very surprising to us. This is not quite what we were expecting. So these um, signals are coming from the very back of the head, right above early visual cortex. So the electrodes in the EEG montage are shown in that um, diagram there, but they're OZ, POZ01 and 02. So right at the very back of the head. Um, and what we're finding is that we get really quite profound binocular increases um, in the response. So that looks like, um, at the very highest contrast, about three times greater response to binocular stimulation compared to monocular stimulation. And that's very, very different from what we see with spatial modulations of luminance, like sine wave gratings. Our stimuli here are temporal modulations. Um, so we're still changing the luminance, but we're modulating it over time instead of over space. And intuitively, sort of naively, I might have expected that the brain would treat those two signals quite similarly. But it seems in terms of binocular summation and binocular combination that that isn't what's happening. Um, and I think that that really shows there's a, a difference there between these two pathways that we're trying to target, the cortical and the subcortical pathways. They seem to be combining signals very, very differently. We get a similar binocular increase at the second harmonic response. Again, it's about three times the monocular response. And that was also very surprising, particularly because second harmonic responses in general are thought to be a signature of some kind of a neural nonlinearity, something like squaring, rectification, that kind of thing in the processing pathway. So if we're seeing uh, relatively linear binocular summation, big binocular uh, facilitation effects, 
then that suggests that the nonlinearities that drive the second harmonic response presumably occur after binocular combination. If they were occurring before, if you had a great big power law in there happening before binocular combination, we'd be getting much, much less summation uh, than we're seeing in these experiments. Something else to note about the EEG data is we see almost no dicoptic masking, almost no suppression from that dicoptic mask, um, and certainly very much less than in the pupillometry data. So the natural thing next to do is to model these data using that model that I described earlier. This is the Misetau model, where we allow the weight of suppression to vary across uh, data sets. And first of all, I've done this in what, what you might call the old fashioned way. So I've done a least squares fit to the average data for each data set for each of those three data sets. And then I've generated distributions of parameters by bootstrapping. So you resample the data, fit the model again, make a note of the parameters and do that thousands of times to build up some distributions. And when we do that, you can see in the bottom right plot that the weight of suppression is much, much higher in the pupillometry data than in either of the EEG data sets. This is a log scale here. Um, so th these are, uh, well, the weight is around one for the pupillometry data and it's around 10 to the minus six for the EEG data sets. So really colossal difference there in the amount of suppression implied by these, um, these three data sets. I said this was modeling the old fashioned way. It turns out that what these uh, distributions of parameters really are telling us is how often we'd expect to observe data consistent with each parameter value if we were to run the experiment lots and lots of times. Now, technically, that's not really what we usually want to know uh, when we're doing this kind of modeling. What we really want to know about is the probability of the model parameters being correct. So really, the correct way to do this is a Bayesian modeling approach where we generate instead the posterior parameter distributions. And so I've also implemented this using a Bayesian modeling approach, uh, some software called STAN that allows you to um, sample and build up uh, posterior distributions. It looks broadly similar, really. The story looks very similar, um, a little bit neater in the Bayesian case. Uh, the, the main point is that the weights of suppression in that bottom right plot differ very substantially between the pupil um, data set and the two EEG data sets. Uh, this is still a bit of a work in progress actually because there's a slightly weird issue to do with averaging where when we average our empirical data we use the coherence average which incorporates the phase component of the Fourier um, spectrum uh, and unfortunately the Bayesian model at the moment at least doesn't know about that and so it gets the averages slightly wrong which is why the curves in the top three plots don't sit beautifully on top of the points as they did with the least squares fits but you can see that the character of those model uh, fits are broadly correct they're broadly doing what the what the data is doing uh, it's just that we don't average in exactly the same way between the model and the data Anyhow, the main point to take away from this is it looks like we get very different responses from different binocular pathways that we can probe using EEG and pupillometry at the same time. It looks like the EEG um, responses, which sh should be indexing the cortical, the canonical pathway, actually seem to be quite linear and feature very weak interocular suppression, whereas the subcortical pathway, the responses from the pupils, are much more nonlinear and involve stronger suppression between the eyes. And both of these findings are really very different from what we see for spatial contrast, for gratings. So the last experiment I'm going to describe um, asks whether perception is consistent with this apparently linear combination that seems to be happening in the visual cortex. We can do this by using a matching paradigm. Uh, and this is a, a very time-honored psychophysical way of looking at binocular combination. The idea is that we take a standard stimulus, which is the same uh, signal in both eyes, and we match that to a target stimulus, which might differ between the eyes. And we can plot the results in a two-dimensional space as shown on the right, the left eye's contrast shown on the y-axis against the right eye's contrast on the x-axis. If we want to uh, have a target where the signal is of equal strength in the two eyes, that means that we're matching along that diagonal gray line that I've just plotted. If we want to have a target 
where one eye has no signal in it at all, and the other eye has all of the signal, then that means that we're moving along uh, the vertical and the horizontal. And we can also take different ratios of left and right eye signal intensities um, and find thresholds along all of these radial lines coming out from the origin. And the question then is where along these lines do participants make a match to indicate that the binocular standard looks the same as uh, the target stimulus. Within this space, we can get predictions from the sorts of models I talked about earlier. So along the off diagonal is the prediction of linear summation. And that box, that square, is the winner take all prediction that we talked about early on, where just the eye with the stronger signal dominates uh, our perception. People have been using this paradigm for a long time, and of course there are matching data out there, uh, but nothing for the temporal luminance modulations that we were using in our EEG and pupillometry experiments. It wasn't really clear what we would get um, from our, uh, our new experiment that I'm about to describe, um, because if you look in the literature, here are some data, for example, from Anstis and Ho. They found that luminance increments, just static luminance increments, no flicker here, were approximately linear, that's what's shown in the top plot, whereas luminance decrements, decreases in luminance against a bright background, conformed much more to a winner-take-all um, approach, uh, sort of algorithm, I guess, if you like. Um, of course, in our stimulus, we have luminance increments and decrements because our flicker is increasing and decreasing the luminance of our target over time. Uh, and so it wasn't really clear what we would get. We might get something somewhere in between. Um, of course, our EEG data, which seem to be strongly linear, predict that we should get near linear summation behavior um, from a matching experiment. So Federico ran this experiment uh, quite recently. We've collected data from seven participants so far. We ran this as a two interval force choice matching paradigm. In one interval, we show uh, the match stimulus for one second, still two hertz flicker. Um, in the second interval, well, in the, in the other interval, because we interleave, we randomize the order of the intervals. In the other interval, we show the target uh, stimulus, which can have different um, intensities in the two eyes. And we did this for two standard intensities, 24 and 48 percent modulation relative to the background. We used the same equipment as for the pupillometry study, but without the uh, eye tracker and the EEG system this time, we just did psychophysics. And the participant's task is just to indicate which of the two intervals appears to have the most flicker, the highest flicker amplitude, if you like. We use a staircase uh, to control the target intensity, and then we uh, fit a psychometric function to find the point of subjective equality. We can plot the results in that two-dimensional space I introduced earlier. When we do that, we see that binocularly equal matches along the diagonal are about accurate. So the blue point there appears exactly where both models predict it should, um, and that's no surprise because we're uh, matching a, a stimulus which is the same in both eyes with another stimulus which is the same in both eyes. Gets a bit more interesting when we look at the monocular matches along the two um, axes. Here you can see that uh, for both the left and the right eye, the matches are very near to the linear summation prediction. And indeed, the intermediate ratios of left and right eye intensities are also consistent with that linear summation prediction. And the same is true at our lower stimulus intensity, 24% uh, modulation shown here in orange. One of the rather sort of unusual but quite satisfying things um, about data like this is that the error bars turn out to be radial. They're plotted along those radial lines which meet at the origin because um, the data are constrained to be somewhere along that line. So that's how the error bars end up being generated. But anyway, uh, these data are very clearly consistent with a near linear summation process for flicker perception, just as our EEG data uh, would predict. So what have we seen today? So first of all, for spatial luminance modulations, uh, so for grating type stimuli, it seems pretty clear from a, a, a wide number of studies, a large number of studies in the literature, a wide range of modalities, that binocular and monocular responses are approximately equal in V1 and subsequent areas um, of visual cortex. However, our new data suggests that for temporal luminance modulations, sum summation can be very much more linear. 
um, it, particularly uh, across our EEG and psychophysical results, um, they seem to be much closer to a, a linear binocular combination. However, in the subcortical pupil pathway, there seems to be a rather stronger nonlinearity. There seems to be more interocular suppression there um, than we see in the cortex. And that tells us that different anatomical pathways seem to be combining stimuli across the eyes, signals across the eyes in rather different ways. They may use different algorithms or rather different parameters for the same overarching algorithm. And there might be some adaptive explanations for why uh, that should be the case, for why interocular suppression might need to differ between different pathways and indeed different stimulus types. And that's what we're trying to understand over the next few years. And we were very lucky, uh, Alex Wade and I, uh, to get a, a grant from the BBSRC to look at this. We called it non-canonical binocular pathways in human vision. The idea is to look at some of these alternative um, algorithms and places in the brain where signals are combined across the eyes. We've got four main strands that we're planning to work on. First of all, we're going to extend the paradigm that I've described today using EEG and pupillometry, but this time we're going to look at responses in different photoreceptor pathways. Uh, so we bought some really amazing devices, they're um, light engines that have uh, multiple LED primaries, so they have 10 primaries. We bought two of these so we can stimulate the left and right eyes independently, and we're going to use a rather nifty technique called silent substitution that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that allows us to target specific photoreceptor channels uh, and we're particularly interested in the melanopsin response from intrinsically photoreceptive ganglion cells because those um, are well they, they play a big role in uh, driving the pupil response. So uh, that's one strand of our project. We also want to extend the quiet at our work, looking at the ocular following response. And one possible explanation for that is that there might be a direct route between the LGN and MT, uh, which uh, anatomical studies indicate involves the coniocellular pathway. Um, and it's possible that that direct route, because it's coming from the LGN, which is monocular, might be a distinct cortical uh, location where binocular combination occurs. So it might be that if we're able to target that particular pathway using isoluminant blue yellow stimuli, we might be able to um, dissociate that very, very rapid eye movement um, signal from more typical binocular combination and binocular processing. So we're going to be using um, combination there of EEG and eye tracking uh, to measure that ocular following response and the uh, accompanying neural response. We're also intending to do some neuroimaging to find locations in the brain where we get substantially larger binocular responses uh, comparing different stimuli. Uh, and one of the nice things about MRI, for example, is it gives you uh, responses from subcortical regions, what Alex calls all of the giblets inside the brain, things like brain stem um, and all of those various nuclei. So we're able, we're hoping we're going to be able to isolate places which have this binocular binocular super summation and very strong binocular summation um, for high intensity stimuli. And the final thing we're planning to do in this project is to look at potential clinical applications. So um, thinking about amblyopia, which is a condition where uh, the cortical response to signals in one eye is very much weaker uh, than the response to signals in the other eye, it might be that binocularity is preserved in some of these anatomically distinct pathways, and that might have important implications for the development of new therapies and treatments. So we're still in the first year of this project, but we're making uh, very good progress, um, and I think we're about to start with quite a lot of data collection on probably three out of the, the four of those strands uh, over the next few months. Uh, so last thing I wanted to say then was uh, just thank you uh, to everybody who's been involved in various parts of these uh, of this project, particularly Federico uh, Sagala, who collected most of the data I've presented today, uh, but also Alex, who's a co-I on the grant, uh, and Joel and Daniela, who are both employed on that project. Um, and thank you uh, to the BBSSC funding and to also to all of you for listening uh, to what I was uh, saying today. Marvellous. Thank you very much.